Okay. Good afternoon, friends. Welcome to main library of Kansas City, Kansas Public Library System. And we are presenting today fall loan establishment renovation program that will be given to us by Lynn Lowry, Vico Horticulture Agent. Lynn, the stage is yours. Okay, well, welcome to fall loan establishment and renovation. Um, I couldn't have had a better setup. We had almost an inch of rain in some parts of Wyandotte County, more rain further south and east. And so this talk is very timely because when you're, you get done with watching this, you need to go out in your yard and start the process right now. It's ideal after a rain. If we hadn't had the rain, then I would have added another step in our renovation process. But because of the rain, it's ideal right now to do this process. So without further ado, I'm going to turn my video off so you pay attention to the slides and not to me. Uh, I will come back on when we do questions and I'd like to hold the questions till the end because sometimes I will address your needs in the next slide or two. So if you can write them down somewhere, put them in the chat, then we'll address those at the end, okay? So I'm gonna stop my video and we'll get going here. So I work for K-State. I'm a horticulture agent. That's everything from vegetables to lawns, to trees, to shrubs, to flowers, you name it. My main responsibility is educating people on best management practices how to keep from spending money unnecessarily on pesticides, fertilizers, water, that kind of thing. And then to help you know what grows well in the area. I'm tied to Kansas State University and their researchers there. And then we, our job is to take that data and communicate it to the public. So we do a lot of um, lawn and garden questions, a lot of plant ID, a lot of problem solving, as well as youth education, adult education programs. So I'm not always in the office, I'm out doing programs in the county. So right now is when our lawns are looking the worst. Always August is when people struggle the weeds are still alive and well, and our lawns are looking ragged. If you don't water, they're going dormant. Most of the neighbor's yards, my yard included, have gone dormant. Just with the little bit of rain we had yesterday, they've already started to green back up. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So does your yard look like this? So over here, we have actually, this is grub damage. And the reason we know it's grub damage, see these little holes here? Those are birds that have come in and have buried their beaks into the ground and have eaten the grubs that are doing the damage. The grubs feed just below the soil, they eat the roots. And then if you were to take this brown and pick it up with your hands, it'd pull back like a rug and you would find grubs under that. Grubs are basically done feeding right now. So now is not the time to control grubs. Um, or back here, that is a mower. Obviously it hasn't been run for a while and you've got all kinds of weeds. Annual grass weeds are the toughest to control because there's no herbicide that will take a grass weed out of a grass that you're trying to salvage. So you almost have to kill all this or hand pull it. So I tell people, get the sprinkler out, get that area good and wet, and then go out and hand pull the weeds at this point. Or you're going to have to do the lawn renovation that we're about to talk about. On here, you've got more weeds than you do lawn. Lawn has gone dormant. A lot of people call me and think their lawn is dead this time of year. That lawn just goes to sleep. Most of our lawns in Kansas City area are cool season grasses and they go to sleep when it gets really hot and dry. We also have zoysia lawns in Wyandotte County 
in the older neighborhoods and it is actually a warm season grass. So it looks great right now. It loves the heat, doesn't need a lot of water. And so it thrives right now. Here's another lawn that I took a picture of last fall. This was um, when the trees were going dormant and you can see all these brown areas. That is crabgrass. Crabgrass is an annual. And once we hit freeze, that grass turns brown. It's an annual. That means it's laid down seed for next year. And these same spots will be crabgrass unless you do something about that. So what we all want to strive for is a lawn like the one I'm showing you here. Yes. No weeds, green, looks good, low maintenance. That's what we're striving for. Okay, so... Hopefully after this talk, you'll have a better idea of how to achieve that. So here's why it's so difficult. We are right here, okay, right about there. And they call this a transition area because we get too hot for cool season turf. And that's why it goes dormant in August. We are too cold in the winter for warm season grasses like Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, those that grow in the southern parts of the U.S. So we're in that transition zone where plants struggle here. And it's not just turf, it's a lot of plants struggle because of our climate. So you're not crazy if you're having difficulties growing any kind of plants in Kansas, it's a tough climate. Here's an example of where we've got a warm season grass, which is zoysia grass on this side of the lawn. And over here is probably bluegrass fescue. So you'll notice this is early spring, right when trees are leafing out. Your warm season grasses are dormant, but your cool season grasses are thriving. They love the coolness of the springs and the coolness of the fall. They don't like the heat of the summer. If we were to take this picture now, this would be a beautiful green. This would be brown from going dormant, unless they irrigate. So that shows you and thrive together. You will notice your warm season grasses have runners and they are aggressive and they will start coming into the cool season lawn and they will outcompete it. Here we have a cement wall, so it's kept a boundary there. But just so you know, warm season grasses, when they do grow, can be very, very aggressive. They also tend to get in flower beds and become a nightmare to manage in flower beds. So there is no perfect grass, I'll tell you that right now. But I will tell you the other thing you need to know, we're not gonna spend time on this, but how you manage when you fertilize, when you water, when you seed warm season turf is not the same as cool season turf. Totally different practices. So you cannot, if you've got a yard with grasses, that makes it even more difficult in managing it. Okay, so we'll talk about the cool season grasses are up here. This is tall fescue, bluegrass are our options. We probably need to mute somebody. Mm -hmm. Trying to. Yep. And then down here, we've got warm season grass, which is, this happens to be Meyer is the, the um, cultivar zoysia grass. That's the most popular one. We can grow Bermuda grass, but if you grow it, it becomes really weedy and it takes over. So in Kansas City, we don't recommend Bermuda grass. Buffalo grass is our only native turf species. And again, it can grow in this part of the state, but it's really for Western Kansas. It's a low water use grass. It has a whole different texture a whole different uh, feel and a lot of people don't like the color of it. It's kind of thin. It's not as thick as a bluegrass fescue or even zoysia grass, but it can grow here. If you go to Cabela's and you look at their parking lot, 
the parking lot grassy areas are buffalo grass. That's where it thrives. No water, no traffic on it really, say, but it does tend to get weedy. So when we're talking about lawn renovation, we have some goals. We want the lawn to look like this one down here. We want to beautify land. We can do that with turf and we can do that with also different perennial trees and shrubs. We want to shift the area that's considered lawn from weeds to turf. We also on places have hills or slopes, the turf helps to stabilize that soil. So you don't get erosion or soil movement. And then of course, if you have children or grandchildren, you want to maintain a safe place for activities to take place like soccer, tossing the ball back to one another. So if you have a, a lawn that's smooth, no ruts, no holes, no bare spots, then it's safer for the children and for adults to be on the turf. So when we talk lawn renovation, because the majority of our grasses grown in this area are cool season, we're talking about doing it now. It's done in early fall, which is usually September for cool season grasses. Again, that's fescue and bluegrass. The reason why we do it now is because our soils are warm. So the seeds, of the turf grass germinate really quickly and establish quickly. Plus, we will eventually have cooler nights like we had last night, and that just encourages good root development. And you get good establishment before winter. And typically, we have less weed problems. But you have to take care of the weeds before you do renovating. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. So let's talk about tall fescue. If I had only one grass to choose, I would choose tall fescue. Tall fescue will take some shade. It will not grow under 50 year old dense trees. It will not. There is no grass that will grow because there's two things going on here. You have a lot of root competition from the tree for water and nutrients. And then all green things need sun to grow. And so with dense shade, you don't have enough sunlight getting to the turf. Therefore, it's really thin. Sometimes you'll even have a bunch of moss growing under trees because of the, the poor soil, the moisture that is retained because of the dense shade. And then, you know, it's just not good for grass, but sometimes moss will grow. And you know, that's okay, it's green. Tall fescue is generally propagated by seed. You can buy sod, but if you buy sod, they have to use a netting to hold the, the root system together. Fescue is a bunch grass. It doesn't have runners that holds it together. So sometimes when you buy sod, it has that mesh and that mesh never breaks down. So I'm not a real proponent of sod. Now there are times when you have to have sod, like on a bank, or if you're trying to get a quick cover, um, have kids on it, that kind of thing. But I would stick to seed. It's by far the easiest to, uh, and cheapest to get going. Tall fescue seeds germinate in seven to 10 days. That's important to know so you don't give up. When you seed any grass seed, you gotta keep it wet until it germinates. And then you slowly back the water off because as we all know, too much water, roots rot. And you don't want your roots to rot. You want healthy roots. Kentucky 31 is the fescue that I grew up with. It is coarser in texture, less dense sometimes, lighter color. And sometimes when we plant it, it's connect contaminated with orchard grass, which is a really tough annual weed that's hard to take out. Remember I told you, it's almost impossible to take a grass out of a grass unless you can wet the area and pull it out. Or you would have to use Roundup or glyphosate and then you would kill any desirable grass that you hit as well. 
But Kentucky 31, if I lived out on acreage, that's the grass of choice I would have. I might have fescue, tall fescue around the immediate property, but out a few feet, I would go with Kentucky 31. It's more drought tolerant. And like I said, the downside to it is it's a coarser texture. So people don't like to walk on it barefoot. Kentucky bluegrass is our other season turf. This is the one that most people uh, want because it's got a beautiful green color. Uh, if it's irrigated, it can be really dense, beautiful lawn. Um, it's propagated by seed or sod. It can actually be sodded without that mesh under it because it has little runners that uh, keep it together. So the mesh is not required when you buy the sod. But remember the downside, there is no perfect grass, is heat tolerance. Once we get into weather like we had the last three weeks, it goes dormant, turns brown, and then it'll perk back up. Okay, most of our grass seed that we buy at grass pad or the nurseries, um, those are blends. They're blends of tall fescue and bluegrass. And that is really the best option. All of these species do get diseases if conditions are favorable, but they don't get the same disease. So the disease that affects tall fescue is very different from bluegrass. So if one of the grasses gets the disease, the other grass will still thrive and you won't lose your entire lawn. So I would recommend these blends. And you're gonna have to go, like I said, to a nursery, like grass pad, family tree, suburban, um, to name a few. You aren't gonna find these good blends at Walmart, at Lowe's. And the reason I say that is the big box stores buy regionally. So they're probably gonna buy grass seed that may do well in Texas, not necessarily here. Um, so if you go to the local nurseries that know the customers, know what we need, they will have grass cultivars for this area. So don't get chintzy when you're buying your grass seed. And the good money will grow well here for long-term um, longevity. So the first thing we're going to talk about is site preparation. So what do we need to do to our lawn right now? so that we can change it from a weedy mess to a lush green lawn. The first thing we're gonna do, if you haven't done this, is go out in your yard and do a soil test, okay? And we'll talk about that. It's going to tell you what your current phosphorus and potassium levels are and what your pH is. The pH of the soil is important. It dictates whether nutrients are available for the plants. If the pH is too high, certain nutrients that the grass needs are not available. If it's too low, which never happens in Wyandotte County, most of our pHs are too high, but the same thing would happen. Certain nutrients wouldn't be as available to the plant. They're in the soil, but they're not available to the plant. The next thing you need to consider is weed control. Now is the time to get the weeds under control before you plant one seed. And then you need to prepare the soil or cultivate it a little bit. And that can be either with a rake or if you're redoing your entire lawn, that's when you might wanna go rent some equipment. So how do we do a soil test? If you look at this diagram down here at the bottom, you go out into your lawn and you would randomly take samples wherever you see these white dots. You would dig down either with a hand trowel as deep as the roots go, which on sod is about four to six inches. You would put all of this in a bucket, mix it up with your hands and then pull out one cup, put it in a Ziploc bag, label it, especially if you're doing more than one sample. So you might wanna do one sample in the front yard, one sample in the backyard, one sample in the side yard. Or if you have an area you just can't grow anything in, 
It won't tell you what's wrong with the soil, but it will tell you the pH and those nutrients that are available. Okay, so hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory. You do the same thing whether you're testing a garden or a flower bed. You want random samples of soil so that you know basically what your soil is like. The second thing and the most important step that people miss is you've got to get the weeds under control. And right now, today, tomorrow, this is when you do it. We've had a rain. That rain has told your grass and weeds, woo hoo hoo, party time. I am going to grow like crazy. That's when they will readily accept the chemical. If we hadn't had rain, I was gonna tell you, get your sprinkler out, water the lawn, okay? So we don't have to do that. So that's a little cost savings. Now, if you can't get foot there tomorrow, then you're gonna miss the window of opportunity. So there's two ways of controlling weeds. There is selective weed control, which is what this guy's doing here. This is a fancy rig on the back of a little tractor. And they're putting out a broadleaf weed control product, which only takes out the broadleaf weeds, okay? This is pretty good turf. It looks really good. So that's all they need to do. Down here, this is where they're starting over. They've used a non-selective herbicide that kills anything green. It'll kill these trees if you spray these trees. You have flowers in this bed over here. It'll kill those. So this is non-selective. This is where you're starting over. And sometimes you need two applications. So you want to do that now and whatever that label says. It may be two weeks later. It may be 10 days later if you have more green showing up. Sometimes when we're doing an area like this small, we're doing it by hand and you may get a skip or two. So then you'd have to go back and hit it again for whatever the label says. So a couple common selective broadleaf herbicides that you can buy anywhere is Weed Be Gone. You've got to read the ingredient statement, which is right down, well, I guess it's right here. There are Weed Be Gone products, probably 10 different ones, and they all have different active ingredients to the controlling of the weeds, and they're listed right here. The ones for broadleaf herbicides are right here. This is the actives right here, Dicana, MCPP, 4D, okay? And they're usually in all the Weed Be Gone products. You can also buy these separately. Sometimes they're harder to find. Another good one is this weed-free zone. There's also speed zone. They have a few more products in it that are good for some of the perennial weeds like clover or uh, dandelions. Okay, the weed be gone will do dandelions, these guys here. Timex is another common herbicide that is a little more powerful than some of these up here but you need to read the entire label and understand number one, some of these have heat restrictions. So you can't apply them if the temperatures are gonna get above 90 degrees. You need to pay attention to that because what happens with these products, if it gets over 90 degrees, then they become a gas off the plant and they move and they'll kill your neighbor's tomatoes, red buds, potatoes, you name it. So you need to read the label, understand the precautions, understand the rate to use, understand how frequently to treat, understand when to treat. That will all be on those labels. Now the non-selective herbicide, if you're wanting to start over, kill everything off, have glyphosate. It's the active ingredient in the product. And there's Roundup. Roundup is now off patent. So there are other products with glyphosate in it may be cheaper than Roundup. But again, you need to read the label. A lot of these products have residual in them that would not allow you to plant seeds. That's not true with glyphosate. Glyphosate does not last very long in the soil. The label will tell you how many days you need to wait to seed the area. 
but some people will pick up the wrong container and buy picloram. Picloram will kill trees. It lingers in the soil, it will kill trees. So you've got to be serious when you're buying products and know what you're buying. Read the label before you purchase it. And you can pull these labels back and they'll let you read them in the store. Okay, so now that we've controlled the weeds, this is what your yard may look like if you've done a total control method, okay? You've killed everything off, all right? So you might wanna bring in one of the rototiller because this is gonna be a big area. I would think I'd wanna take this on with a hand rake. And you wanna loosen all of this dead debris. And if you can, rake it off. Um, you can get a power rake that you can rent uh, to use on this. There's also, um, and I'll get to that here in a minute, some other equipment you can use. But this is serious. We're talking serious renovation. So that's, once you have the soil test, remember I told you it tells you how much phosphorus and potassium. It also tells you the pH. Now is the time that you would alter the soil pH or add any of the fertilizers that are lacking. You would do that before you plant the seed. You'd wanna smooth out this area so that you eliminate any ditches or ruts or holes and make your lawn as level as possible, if that's even possible. Some of you might be on slopes. The key to all this soil prep is you have got to have every seed touching bare soil. If you just kill the lawn, spread your seed out, and that seed stays up on that dead material, it will never ever root and germinate, okay? So if you're gonna do it, do it right. Okay, power rake, this is what I mean by power rake. It's got these blades underneath that basically beat the ground and they make ruts into it so that the seed will fall into the ruts and have good seed to soil contact, okay? If you have small areas, you can use a hard kind rake. This is actually a turf rake that people can sell you. You don't have to be that fancy, just a, a hard kind rake will work as well. There's also core aerators. That's the machine here that little plugs out of the soil. And the theory behind here is when you seed, the seed drops in here and will germinate, okay? It also is great to uh, remove compaction from your soil. So even if you aren't reseeding, it's always a good practice to core aerate every two to three years in September. That's the timing for cool season lawns. The reason we use September, this is destructive to the turf. You're removing these plugs. And so you do it when the plants are the most likely to recover, when they're the happiest. We're getting into cooler nights. We're getting into usually some rain. And so the grasses recover quickly. You would never do this in July or August because the grasses would never recover from that kind of damage. Okay. Another thing that people don't do, they just buy a bag, bag of seed to go out like they're feeding chickens and start throwing it out. If you're doing a big area, you wanna actually weigh this grass seed. For Kentucky bluegrass, you put two to three pounds of the seed per thousand square feet. For tall fescue, three pounds per thousand square feet. And so it looks something like this. If you watch the grass cat, grass pad commercials, when they show it, it, you can't even see the soil, they have it so thick. Remember, like everything, they are all gonna compete for nutrients and water. So you want them to be spaced out a little bit so that they're not all competing with one another to get established. So if you have your seed mix too heavy, it'll probably come up and look beautiful and then it'll start dying off because it's competing with one another for good root growth. Now, the thing people also don't do, I can tell you all the don'ts that people don't do because those are the phone calls that I get. Let's say this is your house 
and this is the area you're renovating. People would just go buy a 50 pound bag of seed and they'll just spread it out here. That's not the way to do it. I'm here to tell you we're here to you know, do things right. We wanna save you money. Grass seed is not cheap. So what you need to do is go back to your math class and you're gonna make this area into rectangles, triangles and squares if you have to. And you're gonna do the length times width, right? To get your area. And then you're gonna add all that up and that should give you how many square feet. And you're gonna go to a nursery and you're gonna say, I have this many square feet, how much grass seed do I need? And they're gonna help you with that, okay? They're gonna weigh it. So once you've got your seed for the area, you're gonna place it in usually a rotary spreader of some sort, and you're gonna apply it in two directions, okay? So that you don't have skips. After you have it placed on the ground, the seed, you have good soil to seed contact, then you're gonna need to water that area thoroughly. And I've got on here 15 to 30 minutes. It just depends on the type of soil you have. It could be shorter than that, or it could be longer than that. And you're gonna keep this soil moist, not to where water's standing, but where the seeds will germinate. Okay, when they start to germinate, then you start backing off the water because too much water will rot the roots. Okay, if we're just doing spot areas, you can see here we've got a good stand of grass and we've got these bare areas. We've roughed that up with a rake or a hand trowel so that this is loose soil. Then we are seeding, and in this case, you can feed the chickens because you're probably going to waste too much seed if you use one of those rotary um, uh, pieces of equipment. And again, you want it so that you've got good grass seed coverage, but you don't want them covering each other that you don't see the soil. And then you would get out your sprinkler. So first step, here's for small areas. I love this tool because it's small enough I can get in there and rough up this area, okay? The second step is I put my grass seed down. And you can see how dense I've put it. Then I get a bag of garden soil and I actually put a thin layer of garden soil over the top of the seed, mainly to keep it in place and keep the birds from eating it. I have a whole bunch of birds in my yard. They get hungry this time of year and they will eat my seed. And then the last step is I get the sprinkler out and I water and you can see I've got little baby grass coming up. And by the end of about four weeks, this whole area was covered with new grass seedlings. I back off the water so that they get good root development. Okay. Watering. Watering is the hardest thing to teach everybody. So I don't care if it's grass, if it's a house plant, if it's a shrub or a tree. The key to watering is what we call deep and infrequent. You need to water as deep as the roots go. So how do I know that? If I'm doing a tree, I have a really long screwdriver that my dad gave me and it's got a the end of it's probably 12 inches. And I will water and then go out and put that in the ground. And if it is easy to put in the ground, the water has gone deep enough. If it's resistant down about four inches, then I know I need to water longer because tree roots are somewhere in that 12 to 18 inch range. With the turf we're talking, those seeds aren't very deep. They're not maybe a quarter of an inch deep, if that. So. So you're not going to need the water to go as deeply. Therefore, you may have to water them. If you have turf already established, you want to water as deep as probably four inches because that's where the roots are. The key, though, to watering, you have after the grass is up, you have to back off the water so that roots have oxygen. If you keep that area wet too long, the roots will rot. Same with the house. If you're watering a house, plant, you really need to take it to the kitchen sink, water it thoroughly, water comes out the bottom of the holes. 
you can then pick up the container and if it's heavy, it's been watered thoroughly. Sometimes our house plants, the soil will shrink up away from the sides of the container. And when you water, it immediately goes down through the bottom and you haven't watered any of the soil. So again, use the lifting and weight measure to know if you've got adequate water. Okay. So we're talking about doing this in the fall, sodding as well. Although you'll see sod can be laid about any time the grass isn't frozen. But if you're buying a new house, the builder will lay sod because that's part of their deal any time of the year. But if I had a choice, I would wait just like we did on the seeding and I would do it in the fall because that's when you have cooler nights, you usually have more rainfall and it's just the time that these cool season grasses say, yes, I love this time of year, I'm gonna grow like crazy. In the summer, we have too hot of uh, weather, we have drying winds, diseases can be a problem. And of course our water bill can be a problem. So for sod, you would prefer the soil just like you would for seeding. That sod has to have good soil contact. And if you do it right and keep it wet, it will also root down anywhere from seven to 10 days under good conditions. But sod is usually high for most people to put down. Okay, now the thing I see people don't do is they'll say, oh, I can't mow that baby grass. That, you know, that'll kill it. Wrong. You need to mow that baby grass the same way you would your established turf. Once it gets about three inches tall, you need to mow it, okay? That will actually encourage better root growth. Always remember, taller grass, and I don't mean six inches tall, I mean three inches tall, grows deeper roots, meaning it can extract water from the soil easier, less watering on your part. So there are, and I'll talk about this in a minute, there are recommended heights for these cool season grasses. And do not, do not, do not catch the clippings unless you're composting and need them for the greens for the compost pile. Clippings are 90% water. So leaving them on top of the turf helps to put water back into the soil as they break down. Now that doesn't mean you want wind rows of grass clippings that are gonna smother the turf beneath. So you should be mowing, and I think I have a, another slide here. You should mow when the turf gets three to four inches tall. You should only remove one third of the grass blades at a time. Then you won't have that wind row effect. And then always make sure you sharpen your mower blades. That needs to be done about every 10 hours of mowing. Okay, fall fertilization. Regardless if you're renovating, if you have cool season turf, you will fertilize September and again in November. And remember, when we're seeding, we have already put our fertilizer down, okay? So that's the September application. Then we say do another fertilizer in November. So about Thanksgiving time is when you wanna go out and do your fertilization for the fall. This is the time when the grasses are growing at their best. So you want them to be well fed, okay? So if you irrigate, you may also wanna do a fertilization in May, but if you do not fertilize, We'll have enough left over from this fall application that your turf will be just fine. So in review, first thing you're gonna do is take a soil test. Then you're gonna do weed control in the next day or two. You're gonna, once the weeds are dead, the turf is dead, then you'll do your soil prep. You'll loosen that soil up, you'll remove the dead stuff off of it. Then you're gonna purchase quality seed. You're gonna know the amount you need by measuring your yard. And then you're gonna seed at the right time. You have really the whole month of September to get your grass seed down. 
I really wouldn't push the envelope too much into October. The reason why is you want good roots before you go into cold freezing soil. You want to seed at the right rate, two to three pounds per thousand square feet. And again, I can't say this enough, seed must be in contact with the soil and then you need it to be watered properly. Keep it wet until it germinates and then start to back off your watering. And then once you get turf three to four inches tall, you do need to, to mow it. And then you follow up with a November fertilization. So, all of us would rather have this kind of turf than this kind of turf. And to get that, we've gone through the steps, so hopefully you will be successful in achieving that. So, what do we have for questions? Okay, uh, Lynn, I, like I spoke with you the other day, I have a really steep hill that uh, we, we, we put sod down and based on the pictures that I've seen, that they're, they're being attacked by grubs. So when is the best time to treat that? Um, because I don't want to keep spending $800 every summer to sod that hill. Well, first off, let's make sure you have grubs because that's an easy cop out to say, oh, I've got grubs. So if you have grubs, you ought to be able to pull that turf up. And if you have 12 grubs in a square foot, yes, you probably have grubs. But if you have one to two in that square foot, that's a perfectly healthy lawn. You will always, 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 always find grubs in your soil. That's not a bad thing. It's when they get into that threshold of 12 to 15 per square foot. So don't assume, but if you did have grubs, you would do it in early June. That's when they're feeding, that's when they'll, they'll eat the insecticide. But remember, when you use grub control, you're killing earthworms, you're killing millipede, you're killing all kinds of good insects in the soil. I've lived at my house 20 years, never used any kind of insecticide in my lawn. Have I had grubs? Probably, but not devouring the entire yard. There's where I've been able to pull up the turf, hand pick them out, squish them with my hand and, and move on. Um, so again, make sure before you buy any pesticide, that you really have high threshold of grubs and you would see them. Okay. Uh, I have, okay, another question because there's, there's a lot of damage to the heel. Uh, like you said, the, the erosion, trying to see the hill and get it to stay put is going to be a tall task. So what, what do you suggest? If you look at the commercial people, they buy those seed mats yeah. or play straw over it, something to, you know, as the droplets hit the soil, not to move the soil. So anything you can do to cover the seed bed with straw or those, those uh, seed mats, that will help. But again, as you and I talk, the really right thing to do is to um, change your slope. And that can be quite costly. Yes. Okay. So Lynn, uh, another question. Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, this protocol you gave us in this program, uh, deals with cool weather grasses, right? So how do we prepare the lawn for warm weather, warm season grasses? Okay, so you would do everything in the heat of the summer. Your, your warm season grasses prefer heat. So you would do your seeding in June. When the soils have warmed up, that's when you would do the process of the zoysia grass. Um, the buffalo, I would not recommend Bermuda grass, period. Uh, but it would be a totally different, it'd be, you do, you always do your seeding when the turf is the happiest. And for the warm season, that's June, July, August. Once we get into September, if we have an early freeze, they start going dormant. So June would be when you would do basically everything we've just done here. 
uh, usually with the fest or zoysia grass, you would buy plugs or sod, and then you would plug your yard. You can buy seeded zoysia grass. There are some seeded varieties, but back in the day, it used to be you could only put down sod or sprigs. Thank you. And you Thank and you. Lynn, you said your personal recommendation for uh, Kansas and Wyandotte County grass would be fescue. Or a blend, a bluegrass fescue blend. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Any particular recommendation for us? Fertilizer. Me, I, I've I've had good success with it. Malignite. Um, what do you think? Malignite is yes. sewage sludge. The downside of sewage sludge is it has heavy metals in it. <laughs> so I I'm not a proponent of it. If it works for you and you don't care about heavy metals, then knock yourself out. But if I were growing a garden, I would definitely never, ever, 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 ever use melorganite because I don't want heavy metals in my carrots, my potatoes, those kinds of things. Um, basically, fertilizers are salts. So you have to be careful that you don't upset the fertilizer or you get those big yellow spots that become big dead spots. But any fertilizer um, is going to be about the same unless it's uh, like mill organite, which is sewage sludge. Okay, well. Anything else? Here's a question. Is aeration for compacted soils also recommended for mm -hmm. large lawns? You, I, if I had a compacted lawn, I would go rent a core aerator. Now, people oftentimes go buy those things they can put behind their, their little lawnmower and they have spikes. That is not what I mean by core aerating. Those spikes do nothing but compact the, the soil where it drives that spike in. A core aerator pulls those plugs out, okay? And so that's what I would rent and use if I had compacted soil. That will get you down anywhere from an inch to two inches, pulling those plugs up, opening up that turf to oxygen. And what about the areas uh, where you walk on, heavy traffic that's areas? Okay. That's okay. Now I will tell you that if you have a dog or kids, and let's talk about the dog. If you have a dog that runs the fence and you have a, a bear area, I don't care what you do unless you get rid of the dog. You, that dog has compacted the soil, pushed all the oxygen out, and the only way to, to grow anything there is to remove the dog long term. Uh, you can try core aerating it, but as soon as they compact it all back down, push the oxygen out, no, no roots will grow without oxygen. Football fields, they're core aerated all the time because of the compaction on the soil. So, um, and they thrive. What is, what is your, what do you, how do you feel about, I've seen some stuff, this liquid aeration? I've never heard of it. Uh, I think Covington uh, makes some. It's, it's a liquid aerator that you spray on the lawn. I would be very suspect of anything like that. Okay. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. The only way to improve our clay soils is by adding organic matter. So if we were a professional like a turf um, golf course, what they do is they do core aeration and then they will buy compost and fill in all of those holes. And then over time that will improve their clay soil. But most homeowners, number one, don't have the money to do that, nor do they have the back ability. Their back would be out because they don't have the right tools to do all that. 
But when we talk about improving clay soils and gardens, we always tell people to till in organic matter, leaves, grass clippings, whatever they can in the fall so that they have an improved soil over the winter. Harder to do in turf. Okay, well, you've answered all my questions. Good. <laughs> oh, here's another question from Petra. If we put weed and seed on lawns, then lo later mow and catch clippings, how long do we have to wait to collect the lawn clippings for composting? That's a good question. I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that. Um, I do know that your residual product like Trimac, um, that will linger for months. And the, the bottom line is don't do it. Don't keep clippings from treated lawns for the compost because there is no way to know how long they would stay active on that. And your compost bins don't get hot enough to destroy the herbicide. So I just would not compost those, period. Oh. Uh, okay, I'm trying to do that one. Anything else? Does anybody have any more questions? No, you've answered my questions. Here's yeah. one. How close can we get with killer to our flower garden beds? That's where you would read the label. But if I am spraying any product to control weeds, I actually keep a cardboard box that I have flattened and I actually shield the desirable plants or flowers with that as I spray, just so there is no drift. That cardboard box will catch the drift. Yes, it's harder to do, but that's the safest way to avoid that. Mm -hmm. okay. Looks like you answered all our questions. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. It's really helpful and um, I will post the video on our programming blog. I posted the link in the chat. Um, look at the beginning of the chat, you will see the link. Thank you very much, Lynn, and everybody. Thank you very much for participation. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, ladies. Bye-bye.